Very nice. Without further ado, one more uh, round of applause for my friends and yours from Blur. Ladies and gentlemen, Blur Studios. Ready. Woo! moment my program is reactivated and I am handing over command of all global field operations to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, firstly, we just wanted to thank Pixelogic for letting us be a part of Zebra Summit 2018. We're like really excited to be here. And a big thanks to all of you for letting us talk at you for 90 minutes. Um, so we're going to go over our Blur Studios character workflow. And uh, so firstly, what, I'll show you a little overview. Um, 
First, we're going to go over our, our latest cinematic, the Destiny 2 cinematic, and just kind of go over briefly how we get our characters from game to pre-rendered res. And then we're going to segue into Frankie's presentation on skin detailing, and that can apply to both creatures, characters, like photoreal human beings. And then after that, Damien's going to go over his hair workflow and show you a really cool technique in fiber mesh. I think it's going to blow your minds. Uh, <laughs> after that, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about artistic motivation. And at the very end, we're going to have a little Q&A section. There it is. <laughs> so without further ado, here is our latest cinematic. See that, Petra? Petra? Guardian? Must have knocked out the cum relays with that spectacular landing. And cue the ominous music. Okay, everybody. Back in your cages. <laughs> well, I said, back in your cages! Really? All you got? Help me out here, little buddy. So, 
when we fir were first presented with this uh, uh, cinematic, um, Bungie wasn't yet done with their uh, game models, so um, they gave us some pretty early game models and some concept art, and it was great for us because that left a lot of interpretation on our end. So we took their initial game models and um, grabbed some references that pertain to the, the direction they want to go in. So we felt like that uh, crustaceans was a natural place to start. Um, so we got as many crustacean uh, references that we could find in crustacean-based creatures, and we went to town. And uh, from there, we modeled and looked dev, and here are some slides of those final models. Um, this is the hangman character that uh, Damien did. A um, couple more angles of it. And this is the, the vandal uh, creature that uh, Crystal did. And my task for this was to work on the base body before I handed it off to the other artists. So um, I'm going to show you that, what that looks like in ZBrush real quick. So here is the hangman character that Damien worked on. So it's going to kind of pan around here so you can see all these uh, lovely details. Um, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Give it a second. Hope I didn't crash it. <laughs> too many details, too many great details. <clears throat> As you can see, there's a hundred million polygons going on this, so... But yeah. Um, so this was created in a combination of ZBrush workflows and 3ds Max. And... Uh, Again, built on the initial base body that I created. Um, and in this next creature, this is the Vandal that Crystal worked on. So. So again, my um, role for this was to work on the base bodies, and uh, pretty much the way, the way I handled this was I leaned heavily on uh, Texture XYZ's uh, animal packs, specifically the frog textures and um, the ostrich skin textures. And I should also point out, before I even got to the detailing stage, I took their initial game model and I uh, made a DynaMesh of it and I sculpted it, pretty much the, the anatomy before I was able to do the detail on it. So after I did the, the DynaMesh models and sculpted it, I retopologized that, and then I prepared it for all the, all the details. Um, so I'll do a little close-ups here. And not only did I use um, Texture XYZ, I, I also used a lot of uh, uh, various alphas I found from the ZBrush community, and just good old damn standard brush and uh, standard brush. Um, What's great about the skin detailing workflow, it's very simple, as you'll see in a few moments, um, and it can be very versatile. It could be done for anything from creatures, like you're seeing here, to humans. So um, it's definitely a very versatile, simple uh, workflow. Now look how cute he looks. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it. <clears throat> so the benefits of this workflow is, um, well, of course, we want to take characters to high-resolution photoreal finish, so that's, this workflow definitely caters to that. Uh, it's, it's simple. The simplicity of this workflow, it's uh, a few brushes, uh, alpha libraries, and a little spotlight to go a long way. And it's fast. Um, this allows for quick turnarounds, and the quicker we get it to a certain level, we can push quality even, fur even uh, further. And uh, my favorite, it, it's fun. Um, what's great about doing this workflow allows me to stay in ZBrush for the duration of it. And I don't know about you all, but I like to stay in ZBrush as long as I can. 
Um, so before I get into it further, um, I'm going to show you some examples of this. On the left, we have our raw scan. In the middle is a, a final detailed uh, model. And on the right is uh, our, one of our final renders. Uh, a couple more angles of the ZBrush model. And a couple more angles of that uh, fully rendered. On the left, you see a raw scan. And the right is uh, the, the final detailed uh, model and a render of that. And again, the left is the raw scan, right is uh, the final model, and a render of that. Uh, here we have an arm, and in a few moments, I'm actually going to be uh, demoing on the arm. But this is the final model, and that render. And last but not least, here's a close-up of our hands and a final render of that. So before I get into the demo, I'll just go over some of my steps. Like I said before, it's a pretty simple workflow. I really only have about four steps, and I utilize pretty simple tools. Um, and my first step is to do what I call the fleshy pass. And that's pretty much just using the clay buildup brush, using a round alpha and a spray stroke. From there, I'm going to do my texture XYZ pass. Um, in this case of the demo I'm about to give, I uh, was using the arm displacement. Um, and uh, what basically what I did, I'd take a bunch of alphas from the various sections of the arm, and this uh, coding system I'll go over, it helps organize it within ZBrush. <clears throat> and I also use a spotlight. Um, it's kind of an older tool, but in situations like this, it actually works out to uh, benefit the, the, the detailing process. And finally is the finishing pass. I'll just use some other um, alphas I found from the community over the years. Uh, Damien's uh, damn standard brush and um, a good old standard brush. <clears throat> so let's get into some demo. <clears throat> OK. So like I mentioned first, the first uh, thing I do is the, the fleshy pass. So I'm going to grab my clay buildup brush. I have a pretty low intensity, about a 1. I'm putting it on a spray stroke, and I'm using the round alpha. <clears throat> and what this pretty much allows me to do is gives me some pretty random noise that kind of caters to a fleshy look. Now, I could do this a couple different ways. I could do this with Noisemaker. Um, and just use the morph brush to kind of erase what I didn't need. But what I like doing it this way is it allows me a little bit more control. And um, honestly, I think it's more fun this way. And I kind of like to do things that I, have, I enjoy doing. Um, so I kind of just go through a whole arm pretty much like so. Um, and I should also point out that I'm using a very light stroke. I don't want to push too hard. And I have it on a layer. Um, because I want to blend this back down to the other uh, passes that I'll be showing in, in a few moments here. But um, you definitely want to take your time with, this, uh, with these steps. Um, it's one of those things that slow is fast, and, uh, and it's just fun to do. So in the interest of time in this demo, I'm just going to jump ahead. Um, and here's the, the finished flesh. <clears throat> And it's a little heavy-handed right now, but it being on a layer will allow me to pull it back and blend it in with the other steps that are coming up right now. So from here, I do um, the texture XYZ pass. Um, I already have all my alphas uh, loaded in. And let me go over how I set this up. So, <clears throat> This is one of the arm displacements. It's a full arm displacement from Texture XYZ. And what I like to do is break up into three sections, uh, top, middle, and bottom. And if you notice, I have three uh, digits here for the alphas. The first digit is, uh, identifies which section of the arm I'm on. The second uh, number is just uh, kind of the column that goes around the arm. And the last uh, digit is just from top to bottom of that particular section. So what that allows me to do in ZBrush, it kind of loads them in um, from the order in which I want to work down the arm. Um, I should also point out, when all these alphas are loaded into ZBrush, any modifier that I use, um, so in this case, I want to set it to surface and a radial fade of 9. 
And what that's going to do is going to set it for every alpha, so I don't have to keep on going back and forth to the modifier tab. And mind you, the surface uh, button, what that's going to do is just going to give me the high fidelity details. It's not going to displace, um, add any unwanted volume underneath. So it just gives me those fine details. Um, so I'll use my standard brush for this. I'll put on a drag rect stroke. And I'll grab the first alpha. <clears throat> So I'm just going to kind of drag these out. I'm going to work my way down the arm. <clears throat> and if you notice that you're on your own skin, uh, your, your pores have a very specific direction, uh, usually opposite of the articulation of your joints. So I want to keep that in mind as I'm weighing this down. Um, you want to be mindful of that. And the final, pass, the final uh, stage of this is, you know, using the, the damn standard brush to kind of blend all these together. Um, but you still want to be mindful while you're laying them down of where the, um, the specific uh, texture goes. But it's not also, I should point out, it's not exactly a rigid process. Like I could use, if you notice, I'm using a, a couple of alphas that, multiple times. Um, so it's definitely not you know, paint by numbers, so to speak. Um, you could be a little bit more uh, forgiving with it. But basically, you just kind of want to blend one into the other. And, uh, yeah. So this takes me a little while to do. Uh, you definitely want, like I said, want to take your time. Um, really think about what alpha you're using and what part of the arm. And uh, have fun with it. So I'm just going to jump ahead here in a second. Um, so right here is the final pass. <clears throat> if you notice the fleshy pass that I did previous, it's kind of really subtle, and you could blend it back. It just adds a little bit of extra um, you know, fleshy look to it. If you turn it off and on, it kind of just gives an extra little volume to the to the arm. So from here, I'm going to do spotlight. <clears throat> so what's great about spotlight, especially for the palm, palm has very specific details. And it will be a little harder to do with um, the alphas, like I was doing the previous step. So. What's nice about a spotlight, I could use this as like a stencil. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with spotlight. It's kind of an older tool, but um, it's great for this. And it kind of mimics some other software's uh, functionalities, but you're allowed, this keeps you in ZBrush longer. So that's kind of why I like using it. Um, so if you hit Shift Z, it kind of hides it. And um, pressing Z all together will bring it into the mode in which you start sculpting down from it. Um, this pivot point is which you would rotate the stencil from and scale from. And if you click outside this ring, you know, that's kind of moving the pivot point. Also, there's um, opacity and a spotlight radius. You know, So when we start st stamping the stencil down, you'll see this in action right here. Um, but my favorite feature about this is uh, the nudge. So what this allows me to do is really take the, the stencil underneath and push it into place. So I can really get this exactly where I need it. And this is probably my favorite feature of this, of this tool. Oh, and uh, one more thing before we stamp this down. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the third level, and I'm going to store a morph target. In a few minutes, um, I'll show you why I did that. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So back up to the top level. So I'm going to grab my standard brush.
I'm going to put on a real low intensity. And basically, I'm just going to start applying this. So something as complex as the palm, you pretty much get in one fell swoop. And that's, what's the, that's the, the great thing about using Spotlight in this technique. <clears throat> um, from there, you could just kind of move your model around and just drop back into Spotlight. So I'll do this for the whole, the whole hand. And again, you want to take your time with it. I'm doing a little faster here for the sake of the demo, but um, it's definitely a great technique for doing the complexity of uh, the details of the hand. Um, I also did the fingers the same way. Uh, so I'll jump ahead and show you that. Um, So the fingers were used, also done using um, the Texture XYZ finger pack. And I, I apply them the same way as by using Spotlight as a stencil. So um, some of the finger, if you look, I got some fingerprints in there. And I just, that's just grabbing some fingerprint alphas and stamping those down. Um, it's, I, think, I believe it's like these subtle details of what really makes it look uh, real or photo real. So the next step is the finishing pass. So from here, I'm going to um, do some veins. Now, when I'm doing veins, it's a, it's a pretty simple procedure. But you definitely, this, I guess the trick to doing veins is uh, staying loose. Um, and I'll just use a, sim a simple standard brush. My hand's pretty loose. And I, I treat it the same way I would do drawing. I'm, I'm doing my gesture drawing. I kind of hold my uh, stylus up a little bit higher, and it allows a little bit more free flowing, um, and I could be a little lighter on my touch. And this is kind of what you want to do for veins. Um, it's, they're not exactly straight lines, um, but they're not chaotic either. So, um. So basically, a lot of my references are either my own hand or just grabbing whatever I can off um, Google searches. But I find that looking at my own hand is the best reference when I'm doing stuff like this. Um, yeah, so to jump ahead. Here's the final vein pass. And the, the final uh, step is all the alphas that I laid down and all the spotlight um, treatments that I did, some of the alphas aren't yet blended together. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the um, damn standard brush, and I'll put it in, I guess, a, a mild intensity. And basically what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go throughout the model, following the lines that, are already, that the alphas already gave me. And I'm kind of just going to blend them through to each other. Now, this is the, the part of the process that takes me the longest, believe it or not. So if an arm takes me the full day to, uh, to detail, I'm probably doing this half the day. I'm really going to take my time and following the valleys that the texture gave me, but I'm also going to be adding more to it and kind of blending this all together. Um, Definitely want to take your time with it. But all the alphas that you put down previously kind of give you an idea where the articulation of that joint is and the, um, the direction of the pores. So um, you're kind of just enhancing it, really. Yeah. And also what I'll do, I'll take um, the standard brush and add a little bit more volume to give them extra fleshy look to the, the palm. And again, I'll put this probably in a lower setting, a lower intensity. So yeah. So this, this kind of process I'm doing for the whole body. So um, it takes a little bit of time, but you can pretty much bang at least 
It takes me about three or four days to do a whole body, so, um, which, believe it or not, is pretty fast, considering. Um, so take your time with it uh, and just have fun. And here is the final result. And the same thing for the detail on the fingernails. I just took the, da the damp standard brush and added some um, cuts in there and just different line work. And of course, I mentioned before, I used a, a fingerprint alpha to put some fingerprints in there. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So that's it. Here, uh, got a couple of questions maybe for you. Oh, awesome. Is that cool? Okay. Uh, hey. Hey, how you doing? Good. Tell us your name again. Jose. Jose. Hey. You're a repeat offender here. Oh, yeah. This is good. A lot of questions. Yeah, good. Um, so usually those XYZ uh, maps are pretty big. Do you yeah. size them down uh, yes. before bringing them in? And also, they usually come with three levels of displacement. Do you combine them before in Photoshop before bringing them in? Um, no, I don't. I usually just use a displacement because a lot of the extra detail I'm putting in with other alphas and just good old hand sculpting. Um, so I, I tend to just take the, the main displacement. Um, and then I, I, I downsize it a bit. So I think they come at like 22,000 pixels or something like that. So I'll probably make it around uh, 14 and work from there. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. You behind me. Hey. Nice hat. Thanks. What's your name? <laughs> Jeremy. Jeremy, nice to see you. So, I wasn't sure if for the demo you just had the arm, or is that a section of the full uh, sculpt, or do you sculpt on a mesh or a model that is the whole uh, unit to, in, you know, to maximize your poly count? Yeah, believe it or not, that is just a section of the full body. Um, so, so yeah. I'm sorry. yeah, so I guess I took the body and I, I did, what did I do? I think it's 48 million polygons in total. Yeah, so it gets pretty heavy. Um, and then from there, believe it or not, we'll use HD. Uh, geometry as well sometimes, especially for close-ups. It depends on like our, our final output. So this is our base body that we use for a lot of different characters. If we know the camera's gonna get real close, we'll drop into HD mode and really get, you know, 100 million more uh, polygons. So each limb is like a separate Z-tool in, in the duct down there. It's not one contiguous mesh. Well, it is one continuous oh, mesh, really? yeah. Oh, and be because we're working in U-dims, it's easy to kind of hide the other uh, parts you don't need. And for the for the demo, what I did, I just took the arm by itself. So basically, that's, that's three different U-DIMs. But for the whole body, we have probably, uh, I think, 20 U-DIMs at like 8K each. <laughs> so it allows for some pretty uh, insane resolution. So yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. There's another question. I thought I saw a hand back here somewhere. Way in the back. Whoa. Get my exercise. Cool. Just a moment. I'm coming. Hold on. I'm coming. I'm starting to date myself with that kind of song. Hey. Howdy. Oh, I couldn't okay. help uh, but notice that you stored a morph target earlier and said you'd tell us what that was for. Oh, I guess I forgot to do that part. Yeah. Oh, my bad. Okay, so um, when you're using Spotlight, a lot of the problems is um, it adds a lot of extra volume to the model. Um, and when I store a morph target in, in like the level three, when I go back to that and I switch that morph target, basically what it's doing is taking away that volume. And when I go back to level six, it's just retaining all that real high fidelity detail without all the extra unwanted volume. Gotcha. Just yeah. this place. So then on the final pass, I'll put some of the volume back with this, my, my own hand and using the standard brush. But my bad for forgetting that part of the step. That was a good question. <laughs> yeah, it made us accountable there. Very nice. Thank you. Well, anybody else? It's not every day you get to talk to these people. Hey, what's a good word? Take that for him. Hi, uh, I'm curious to know for the hand um, texturing phase, do you guys use photo reference or do you guys just hand paint that stuff? A combination of both. In this particular case, um, we took a, a raw scan, so we got a lot of that texture from the raw scan. But inevitably, the raw scans, depending on the exposure, it's kind of uneven, so you have to go back in, in there and do a lot of hand painting. So it's a, a combination of both. And we'll, you, we'll, we'll also use some photo reference. Um, so we have some libraries that we could work from. There's, a, there's actually a question from online uh, through our Twitter feed. The, the question was, um, 
from Rowand RD. I hope I said that correctly. Rowand RD says, um, as character artists at Blur, working with concepts, do you have to make the character 100% like a concept? And how much time do you get to finish a character uh, love Blur infinitely? <laughs> um, well, I guess it depends. Um, if we're working for something like, uh, like the Destiny trailer, uh, we have to stay pretty consistent with not only their game model, but their concept that they supply right. to us. Right. Um, and our turnarounds are pretty fast. From beginning to end, we're probably around 30 days. Um, depending if it's like a superhero character, we might get you know, 35, yeah. 40 days, but it's a pretty quick turnaround. I think it's yeah. pretty safe to say that if something is an established property, that there's probably not a lot of room for exactly for fudging the, the concepts. But some of our own IPs, then it's our own thing and our own control, yeah. so yeah. Okay. Depends on who's paying the bill is probably the best exactly. answer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. Anyone else? Okay, Damien Canderley, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Woo! Thank you. Uh, before I'm um, jumping to the air, my air fiber mesh uh, workflow, I just want, because we are speaking about workflow at Blur and the workflow in, uh, in that matter, one workflow that I'm uh, using all the time, it's the Morph Target. It's a very simple tool, but a very efficient tool for me. In my workflow, it's very, very, um, I use it all the time. I just want quickly to demo what you can do with that. Uh, so, for instance, on this uh, helmet, I did most of the, um, the detailing with uh, Morph Target. My workflow for that is first to store Morph Target, then to do something kind of extreme, like this, like this. Yeah. I don't care if it's too much, on the, because I will be able to to bring my first mesh, mesh back with the Morph tool. So basically, I will do some stuff like that, very extreme, very strong. Maybe some flatten here. OK, so this is the first pass. Now what I'm going to do is to use the Morph tool. Uh, here is it. To bring, to, because uh, with a Morph Target, basically what you're storing is first your uh, stage here. This is my first uh, model, and this is the work I did. With a Morph Brush, you're going to bring back details from the first model. So let's say I find this part to be too strong. I will be able to erase some stuff and to do something very clean. What is cool with this, with this tool, you can also do that with an alpha. For instance, if I'm taking oh man, uh, something like that, I can get here and bring back details like that. And doing something more organical, more uh, You can do something very subtle with it. Okay, so you start very broad and you just erase slightly what you want. Okay, I don't want to spend more time on this. It's very simple and very straightforward. But uh, as I said, it's my workflow and I really use this all the time. So, okay, let's back to my topics today. Um, for instance, uh, you can use fiber mesh. Uh, I'm using fiber mesh to actually create uh, the air from production. Um, it's not the air that I'm uh, doing with fiber mesh, it's the guide. And this guide, I'm using uh, them with Ornatrix in uh, 3ds Max. You can also use them in uh, XGen if you want. On this trailer, for instance, I did this character here, Veilin, and uh, she, she had a kind of kind of long hair with a lot of clumps, a lot of uh, curving. Uh, I can't show you the file for this character, but I will show you the workflow I did to achieve this result. So let's jump to the demo. Here. So, okay. First uh, step, it's... Okay. Oh. It's to uh, define, uh, I will remove perspective, 
the place you want to grow your air from. Okay, I will do that, something like that. Okay, more or less, for the sake of the demo, it will be good enough. Then I'm going to fiber mesh. So by default, fiber mesh will give me a result not very, um, very useful for my workflow because what I want in the end, it's only guides. I don't want as many uh, air as I have right now. So first thing I'm going to do, it's to set the number of air like something 2,000. Next step, I'm going to set to zero most of the, um, the variant uh, settings here. I can set the length of my air, so this is very important depending on what kind of air style I want to do. So for instance, so far, I'm, I want to do something not very long. Oops. Okay, something like that. Coverage, basically, it's uh, the thickness of the air. Since I'm working with uh, not so many air, I want to have uh, some uh, big coverage. Uh, by default, that brush with fiber mesh will create only one side polygon. So it's not very useful because you don't see uh, on some angle, you don't see your air. What I want to do is to have some volume on my, uh, on my air, so I will go uh, to the profile and set the profile to four to get okay to get some volume and I will put a segment segment basically it's a section you will have along your hair and I will put that to 20 okay okay let's back to the settings now um, I will remove the gravity the twist here Gravity, I will set, as I said, everything to zero, zero, zero. Basically, I'm almost done. Uh, what I can do, it's also play with um, the profile of the, the air to get the tips a bit larger than, uh, the roots a bit larger than the tips. And what I also like to do, it's uh, to put a uh, very straightforward color very some, something very saturated at the roots, and something like white at uh, the tips. That way, I can see very easily uh, my air, and I understand the flow. Uh, I also like to use maybe this one. Oops. Okay. Uh, for instance, if you have some air here, it's because of the um, the mask I did. For in, for some reason. There was some uh, mask in the eyes. Okay. So basically, for the first step, I'm fine with that. It's perfect. I will start working with that. So I will accept this uh, fiber mesh. Uh, okay. Now I'm ready to work. Uh, my workflow with fiber mesh for uh, creating guides is actually using only default brush. I'm not using the, uh, all the grooming uh, brush that come with that brush. I'm kind of used to the old brush, because uh, I'm old, I guess. <laughs> and um, so I'm using all the, basically for my workflow with air, it's only move tool, snake hook, uh, the pinch, and the Z project. I will showcase the Z project later. Uh, in order to use this tool, you need first to go to brush setting, fiber mesh, and to put a preserve length at 100. Preserve length basically will, uh, will make your tool not able to change the length of your air. Uh, let's see, if I move my air now, they won't grow as I move them. The only thing I do also, it's uh, put the front collision tolerance to zero. Basically, this uh, setting is uh, telling that brush to take uh, the subtool behind the air in account. I don't want that. I want only to move the air. I don't want to take care of what it's behind there. So now I'm ready. I will basically make my workflow, my uh, flow for the air. I can work with um, symmetry for that to, faster, to get a faster result. 
Okay. Like that. So you can see with this kind of color on the air, you see really well what's going on. If this uh, kind of stuff happens, uh, I mean the air going under the skin, you just hold Alt with the Move tool, and you bring back the air in front of the of the skin. Okay, uh, maybe I will make the air going in front like this. Okay, so when I'm quite happy um, with that, um, I will uh, show you uh, the Z project. Uh, so far, the air, if you look on uh, the side of the head, are kind of going too far away from the head. Uh, for this kind of short air, uh, short air, I want something very close to the skin. So I will use um, that project for that matter. Just turn off that. And what it's going to do, it's project actually my air directly on the skull. So now I know that my hair are really sticking to the skin. And just to bring them back, I can use my move tool again with Alt and just like that. Okay. So now I have my hair very close to the surface of the skin, but with a nice uh, flow that I uh, want to get. Uh, this workflow, you can use it to get some pitch fuzz, to make some fur, to, to make lots of stuff. Okay. Uh, once I'm quite happy with the main flow of my hair, uh, now, maybe I want to have some longer air, because uh, I find some, uh, for some reason that the air at the front of the head are not long enough. I'm going to back to my setting. If you want to go to the setting variable mesh, on my custom UI, it's here. So I just put the preserve length to a lower value, something like 30. And now I will be able to grow my air. I maybe will use the snake hook for this one. Uh, where is it? Uh, here. Something like that. Oh. I, what I like with this workflow, it's, it's, very, it's pretty much like sculpting your hair. Uh, when you're working with Ornatrix or Igen, it's, uh, I, I find it's a bit more technical. You can achieve great results, but uh, I like to get some results with my head directly in that brush, because most of the time when you're working for production, hair are done at the last time. So most of the time when you're working sculpting on your head, either you, you have only that, or you sculpt roughly some air, but it's not as close as you can get with uh, fiber mesh. Um, so, okay, so maybe this, this haircut is fine. Um, no, I will, uh, maybe I want some longer air. Basically, with longer air, it's uh, the same workflow. Um, I will uh, just show you uh, something great with the air, uh, fiber mesh. If you're selecting, you want to mask the air, oops. No, I'm not on the same here. By default, the lasso curve uh, with the masking pen will mask your polygons. It's uh, the normal uh, behavior. It's uh, the same as uh, if I'm taking the head. It will mask my uh, polygons. But there is one feature that is great with the masking tool. If you're taking the freehand tools, you're not going to mask your polygon, but you're going to max to max uh, to mask. Sorry actually your air. I don't know if you're seeing the differences. This is great because that way I can select some air very easily, very quickly. For instance, all this, that. I will, and I can make some polygroup of them. Same here. Oops. 
if I want all this to be the same polygroup. Yeah. Maybe I want this as a polygroup too. This part too. This part here. And you will see in a few minutes why it is very useful to, to get this ability to select very quickly your air and to make some polygroup out of it. So, okay. So now I have this. Maybe I want some longer air, as I said. Are we going to work only with this one? So I'm going to take my move tool to take preserve length to zero. And now I will just make some longer air. OK. Just groom the air, the shape you want. So working with a different polygroup, it's very nice because you know if your f the air on top are really on top of the, uh, the air. Because it's very easy, for instance, if you're working some with, sorry, with air, to move your air, let's say I move this air a bit too much on, this, on the back air, and in the end, they are going to be going through the other air. But because I have some polygroup, I see that very clearly, and I can select them and just bring them back. And if I want this part to stick more to the surface, I can do, as I said earlier, like that. And I will know that they will be very sticky to the surface. And I can just smooth the air to get something nicer. If I'm doing the same here, I will first Z project the air. And, <laughs> and just smooth out the air. I can make this one a bit longer. I will bring this back. OK, uh, maybe a bit more. So I said I was using uh, mostly the move tool, the Z project. And I'm also using the um, pinch tools. Uh, I will show you that. So basically what I'm doing, for instance, I'm going to take that same. I'm going to do some clumps. I, so I will start to go more into details now. Like that, like that, like that, for instance. And now that I have all these different uh, polygroup, what I'm going to do is select one, for instance, use my pinch brush, and I can just go there and make some nice clump, and then just move it. I will do the same with this one. Maybe I want something a bit longer, but then I will pinch it to get something like that. Then just move it again. Same here. OK, I want this to be in front of the here. And OK, oops. Wrong brush. Yeah, pinch and move. I have a key for pinch and move, so I can really go fast with this workflow. Maybe there. Another great feature uh, of ZBrush with, uh, when you're working with a polygroup, uh, it's the ability to mask, um, to do a mask by polygroup. By default, it's an uh, auto masking here. Uh, mask, oops, sorry, auto masking, mask by polygroup. It's the same. I have it always on my interface because I really like this um, feature. Basically, uh, when you put it to 100, uh, when you're going to use the move tool, for instance, it will only move the sub tool, the polygroup you're clicking on first. Okay, like that. So it's easy then to just tweak the air you want. You can do also that with a pinch. Oops. So it will pinch only the first polygroup that you selected. So that way you can work with full air and see everything. Yep. 
So basically, I'm running out of time. This is the feature I'm using. I mean, I don't need any more uh, tools or stuff like that. It's just basically taking more time to groom your hair and do everything you want. Once you're done with all of that, the last part, it's to export that. So for that, I'm going to uh, Fiber Mesh uh, menu, Preview Settings. And if I uh, click this uh, Preview Settings, what I'm saying no, it's the, actually, the actual uh, shapes of the guide that uh, I, will I will be exported. Uh, for a character like that, for the workflow we are using at blur, at blur, most of the time there are too many guides here. So what I want to do is just to reduce the number of guides. So it's just a preview setting. But the preview setting actually will be the number of guides that you will uh, be exported, exporting. Sorry. So for my workflow, usually something it's like that, it's kind of good. So now I just go there, oops, right behind, uh, preview settings. Here, export curve, and I can export this curve as OBG. When you're loading that in uh, 3ds Max or Maya, you can get back the shapes, and then use this guide in Ornatrix to create your air. And if you want to work, you can keep your setting, but work with the full air. So basically, that's my workflow with air. Is that a scan data of your head? The story? Damon, is that your head? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions as they make a... It's my haircut, anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely your head. I thought that. Anybody have any questions? Oh, 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 yes. Hey, what's up? I like your hat. I'm going to sit down with you, right? So what's a good word? Uh, my question is if you, after you long the hair, how you cut with it smooth or anything? So, so you mean in Max and 3S Max? Or? After you grow the hair, how do you give it a, how do you give it a trim? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, how do you give it a chop? It's if, 10 bucks down the street. If you want to cut it? Kidding. Yeah. Is that what you mean? You want to make short hair? Corte, yeah. Uh, it's not right. very uh, the best way, but you can do it something like that. Uh, okay. Using the, um, the clip curve. It's like Enzo's barbershop. Up like that. I'm cutting my hair. But it's not great because actually it's not really cutting your hair. So once you've done that, you need to smooth your hair like that. And basically, you can uh, kind of shorten your hair on making some kind of some uh, sharp cut. I don't know if it's what you were looking for. So it's a way to do it. Because with a smooth brush, basically, if you don't get the preserve length, if you don't get the preserve length, it's like uh, all other tools, it won't uh, change the length. If you don't have that with a smooth brush, it will reduce the size of the uh, air. So. Yeah, it's destructive. Yes. In that methodology, is destructive. It's a, it's hey, you're a lot more gentle than a guy named Frank Ash that I used to get, <laughs> used to cut my hair. So, anyone else? Uh, nothing like a guy betting on horses and dropping cigarette ashes in your hair while he's cutting it. Maybe. <laughs> picture that for a minute. Anybody else? All right. Oh, oh, yes, hey. Oh, other side. Here I come. I'm going mobile. Um, <clears throat> so when you did the segments and you did it at 20, do you use that for all lengths or do you, do you add more segments if you're going to do like really long hair? Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, the question. segments, you know the profile and segments when you're, doing, when you're generating the fiber mesh? Yes. And you, you had it at, at segment of four, or a, a profile of four at segments of 20. Yes. If you do longer hair, do you add more segments? Or do you always use 20? Uh, I kind of always use, use 20 because I'm used to that. Okay. If you're doing short hair, you don't need that much. Yeah. Uh, 20, it's great when you're doing long hair. Okay. Can, and, I, just uh, pause for, sorry, can I pause for a second? Like segments, right? And yes. profile. Profile is four, meaning four faces, and segments is how many bends yeah. the hair is going to have. The right? profile That's, is yes, four segments. Right. What's uh, uh, it? I saw an arm, no? Yeah, oh yeah, I thought so. You see, and there's, there's multiples. Just give me one second, I'll go over here first. Right here first, and you were second? 
Which one? They're going to fight it out. Just kidding. McGregor. Yeah, my question is if you've used this method on curls or dreadlocks. Oh, the, on curls? For, for that, uh, for that. very curly stuff, for very complex stuff, I probably won't use that, uh, that workflow. Uh, if you have some, uh, um, some curling or some uh, dreads or stuff like that, uh, I will probably go with Ornatrix directly in Max or uh, stuff like that. This workflow is great if it's uh, more simple stuff or if you want to actually see your hair with your character. But if you get something very specific, you, I, would, I want you to do it uh, in uh, ZBrush. Okay. Just make sure that these Twitter folks are getting their due and make sure that they're not being neglected. Okay, we'll save this one for the end. Okay, and, uh, so. We thank you. Now I think we're going to move on to. Uh, okay, still? Everybody, round of applause! Yeah, wake it up! Jeez, it's getting late in the day. You should do like a theme song when you do the hair demo like that. You know that old song, hair, long, beautiful. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna do uh, something a little bit different. Um, today I'm gonna, basically when I was thinking about what to do for this presentation, I was thinking, you know, a cool technical demo or uh, showing a sculpting technique uh, within ZBrush, um, but I went back in time and thought about what I would have loved to see when I was earlier in my career or when I was a student. So when I used to go to these kinds of events, I would see these really cool technical demos and like super inspiring artists and just say, wow, that like, I know this technique now, that, that's so cool, but like, when am I gonna be at a level in which I can actually use these tools or these workflows? And when am I gonna be working at a studio that would take advantage of them? Um, <clears throat> so, I kind of got to a point in my career where I really wanted to up my uh, artistic ability and I was kind of plateauing and, and not going in, a, I wasn't getting better fast enough. And uh, recently I had been getting more into physical fitness, so I have kind of a physical fitness uh, metaphor here and I think it, it, it applies to everything. So. Um, in tandem. So if you want champion status, right? You got Michael Phelps. He's really cool. Um, so I imagine that this is, this guy is, he represents, you know, the superstars, the, the best artists, your heroes. Um, individually, like, who do you want to uh, make it towards? Like, who are you, like, uh, who are you trying to uh, imitate in order to uh, reach their level of success or artistic ability? So this could be anyone. Um, so I wrote down a list. What do they do differently? And so I was just writing down a list of things that all these people have in common, like all my, my artistic heroes. They definitely have a passion beyond a hobby. And, and it, it, they don't just do this stuff at work. They do this stuff at home. They talk about it. They think about it constantly. Um, when I first got to Blur, I remember thinking, oh, I finally found my place because I was on a team of character artists that just all would talk to me about crabs for an hour, you know, like, it's just that level of, of passion. Um, talent, I think, is kind of BS. I think really these people, of course, there's different level of talents. Um, you, you, different people will have different genetic gifts. Um, for talent, but really in the, at the end, all these people are super hardworking. Um, they all have a desire to keep learning and they don't think that they're right all the time. Like basically, the best artists I've ever met are always doubting themselves, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and they wanna keep learning and keep um, being inspired and take in knowledge. Uh, they also have a willingness to share and teach what they've learned and uh, share it with the community. They're never content, which is really frustrating, but it's also the fuel that drives you to move to the next thing. Um, 
they're all pretty active in the community and you know you guys are here at this event and I think you guys already have that that down the fact that you've actually taken time out of your your weekend to to come to an event like this means that you are active in the community so you already have this part down and lastly they always make time for themselves to do personal work on top of the uh, professional work that they already do. So a little bit about my personal journey, and this, I can only speak for myself, but when I started out, I was a generalist, uh, and I was mostly hard surface modeler, and I really, really wanted to be a character-specific artist. So I, I, my career was built up with hard surface and building tons of things like helicopters forever, and, but I, what I really wanted to do was be a character artist, so I needed to find that path. Um, I made up a lot of excuses to not do the hardest thing that I needed to do to, in order to actually achieve my goal, um, and I'll go over some common excuses that I had later. Um, I was addicted to taking classes, which isn't a bad thing, but it's a bad thing when you take the class, I would get that artistic fulfillment for a moment and get really inspired, but I would never use the techniques or, or I wouldn't, I would go home and just be like, man, that was so great. And then just go right back into my, my routine. And that doesn't help at all because you'll forget. Um, I was getting really good at stuff I didn't care about. Like, I, I think people who make helicopters uh, at work should really love helicopters. And that was not me. Um, I was also getting really good at things like um, management materials, like spreadsheets, too good at those, I hated it. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't progressing at what I really wanted to do, which was to be a character artist and to up my artistic ability. So when you think about getting in shape, you start out, I, I think I really need to get into shape. So you do your training, your exercises, and you have to do it for a long time in order to achieve your, your fitness goals or your artistic goals. So what do I need to do? Here are my exercises that I knew that I needed to do in order to get to the place that I wanted to be. So I needed to learn human and animal anatomy. I needed to refine my sculpting ability. I needed to get better at shading. I needed to, I needed to learn fur and hair tools. And at Blur, the best part about working there is that you have to do the character in its entirety, including hair, shaders, renders everything. And I wanted to develop a better eye so that I would be trusted to design and, and, uh, and make the best artistic choice for the character. So my common, the common excuses, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of you would agree uh, with some of these. I have no time. So when I was making my, my biggest excuse about having no time, I was kind of basically spending most of my time at work and using that as the, the biggest excuse. And I think you can uh, give yourself the gift of time if you make it a priority. Uh, I'm too tired. Yeah, I was drained at work mentally and I would come home and just want to watch television and not think about any of this stuff. But, you know, if you really take, if you really take the time to uh, prioritize this, you can manage your, your sleep schedules and you can manage like how many hours you wanna, you wanna be doing personal work or learning uh, on top of your, your uh, day job. Um, family and social obligations, had a lot of those excuses like, oh, I have to hang out with whoever and I, my mom's coming down and like, you know, and they would just be endless and you need to make sure to take time for yourself. Um, too lazy, no willpower, it's just another just general one. I am hugely guilty of parallel procrastination, which means I would have a free weekend day, and instead of going to my computer and uh, learning the anatomy of a hand or sculpting and practicing something, I would clean my entire house, do all my dishes, and still get that dopamine high of completing something, but it wasn't the actual thing I wanted to do. Um, I need to upgrade my gear. Um, if your computer can run ZBrush right now, you don't need to go buy the craziest video card in order to get started. You can make beautiful things with the simplest, um, old, slow gear 
you know, you don't need very much. You just need a decent enough um, amount of RAM and it, you know, making that excuse. Uh, and I know a lot of my coworkers and, and myself included, like we had that excuse, like, oh, when I finally get my new computer, then I could start. But that's, that's BS. Um, fear of failure. So at the time I was learning, I knew that I was going to suck. So if I started something, I'm not gonna like it. So I didn't even wanna start it, which is a big mistake, because you have to get through that part. And I wasn't sure where to begin. I wasn't sure if I should learn it and anatomy first, or just make creature designs, or um, practice uh, faces. So I was unsure about that. So this is how I actually broke out of this funk. So I took a page out of Vitaly Bolgarov's book where he made those 30 days of robots while he was on vacation in Hawaii with his family. And he brought his computer and made all those robots. That's insane. Um, I ended up going to Australia for a vacation, for an extended vacation and slash sabbatical because I brought my laptop, my Wacom tablet, and, uh, and just, because of that change of environment, sometimes that's more powerful than your own willpower. So that can, it doesn't have to be something as extravagant as going to a foreign country. It could be just taking your workstation and going out into the living room where your family is because you want to be near them and you can keep working and not think that you're ignoring them. Um, or you could, make, you could take your laptop to a, a coffee shop if, if you're portable or you have um, a surface or something like that. Um, I removed clutter and obstacles, so basically like literal clutter, cleaned up my office space, and also removed obstacles such as um, little excuses I would make to not start. So, oh man, I really wanna sculpt something in clay. Well, I'm really tired tonight and I only have an hour, so I don't wanna slice the clay up and put it in an oven and get my hands dirty and, like, um, and, and do all this stuff. So ZBrush is the perfect tool for this because you can just sit down, open it up, do your thing, save it, and go and get out of there. And you could do that just an hour, just an hour a day. Um, and I formed habits, and these habits of like always doing personal work. And after two months, your brain will make neural pathways in order to make that just the case. So just like going to the gym, you can make it a habit of going to the gym every day or brushing your teeth every day and also doing a bit of practice or personal work every day. Um, I couldn't wait for inspiration because that doesn't always happen, so I kind of just start looking at things or getting started or using Sculpturists and, um, you know, or Dynamesh, you can just go in and, and start doodling and then it, it could turn into something cool. Um, also, your friends are gonna wait for you, um, so don't think in your head like, oh, I'm gonna be socially isolated and, and not see anybody. You can still prioritize seeing the, and seeing them, but you need to also take this for yourself if you really want this. Um, and I made those specific goals like you saw before. And I found that doing what makes me happy really helped push me to do more personal work because I was doing uh, subject matters and, and things that are really, that I'm really enjoying instead of forcing myself to do drills or um, make myself do something that I really, I really don't enjoy doing. Like, oh yeah, it would be really great to make an entire ecroche of a human arm, but is that fun? To some people it is, but not to me. Um, fail early and often, because the more you fail, the better you're gonna be at the end of that, that chunk of time. And just start. Just sit down and start doing something. It could be anything. And it could turn into something else, but that's, that's half the battle. And that's also the half the battle of even like getting to the, just get to the gym and you can't run away. Um, so my personal training for this specific thing that I wanted to do, and you can um, take some of these for yourself or apply it to whatever your goals are. Um, practiced a lot. Um, I streamlined my workflow specifically in ZBrush, so I made sure to make my custom UI, my custom hotkeys, so it was just muscle memory and, uh, and customized to my, the way my brain works, so I would make a lot of my brush hotkeys, much like Photoshop, so V would be move, et cetera. Um, 
I made master copies based on my favorite artists, and I did anatomical studies, um, you know, animals and people, and made sure that I kn knew those foundations. Um, I also timed myself and did speed sculpts of, say, a, a human skull. So once I got to, uh, I did a sculpt off like maybe three years ago, and to train for that, I basically did, I, I tried to get my timing down to get a basic human skull with all the planes set in in about five minutes. And if you can get there in five minutes, then I had all the rest of the time to actually do the, the creature design. Um, make complete pieces and don't ignore the hands and feet. Don't, <laughs> don't just make a cool, a sweet monster bust and think like, there we go, and then never touch a hand. Because it's like, okay, well that's a really cool face, and you're getting good at faces, but if you don't have everything else, you are missing out. Um, don't ignore the skeleton. This is like the number one thing that I always would hear from like some of the best instru instructors and, and artists, and I wouldn't listen to them until, and you know, you just kind of want to go for it and go for the surface detail, but the skeleton is what tells you everything from proportions to where that joint bends to where your muscle insertion goes, and it's, it's really the most important part, so have a think about that when you're studying anatomy. Um, I follow the five second rule. Um, check out Mel Robbins' book if you're interested. Uh, basically, she changed her life by saying five, four, three, two, one, and then she would just get up and go. So for, for example, she, would, she wouldn't hit the snooze button anymore. She would just think to herself, five, four, three, two, one, and just get up. And then she made that same choice for very like, different moments throughout the day, and that helped like, speed up her success. And it makes it so you don't um, sabotage yourself. Like, it, it doesn't give your brain enough time to sabotage yourself, basically. Um, then Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. It's a really great book um, about getting over procrastination. So if you have that habit, Eat That Frog is basically about do the hardest thing that you need to do in that day, and then the rest of the day is gonna go by in a breeze. So there's some interesting side effects from forming this habit of doing uh, and doing personal work a lot more, and, and this is aside from your uh, professional life. Um, I developed a better eye, which is great. It gave me more opportunities. Um, it's a real good antidepressant, just like going to the gym, because it, it just kind of gives you a, a dopamine high creatively and um, fuels you for the next piece. Um, I was receiving, once I put myself out there, receiving more opportunities, and, and it wasn't because I was putting the stuff out there to get a job, I was just putting it out there because it made me happy. Um, I got personal achievement beyond work. Um, I used to have, or wrap my identity around whatever project I was working on, and at the end of the day, that isn't really what's important. Like, I was training at home and doing these pieces that made me happy, and I had this like personal achievement, and that's what I'm like, I can't wait to get home to do. And then it just helps me, my eye and my, my speed at work as a result, and I don't get bothered if uh, the art direction isn't something that I enjoy, or if it's, uh, because at the end of the day, it's not your, it, it, you don't work, uh, the work at work isn't yours, it's for a client. Um, you kind of get addicted to it, just like when you start going to the gym a lot, you kind of get that habit inside your head, and when you don't do a gym day, you'll kind of feel a little weird. <laughs> so, um, at the end of the day, what I want to leave you guys with is, um, you know, we're all on the same path, and it just depends on where you are and how uh, quickly you're progressing. And, uh, you know, some of us will plateau, some of us will have like, there's like a rocky area or you'll like sidestep the path, but then you'll make your way back onto it. So, you know, we're all here and it just depends on time and, and your drive and, and, um, and how quickly you can get up there. So, <laughs> I have just to, uh, just to make anyone here feel better, I will show you some progressions of all three of us. Uh, uh, really early, really early art, and then um, where we got to eventually. So, ooh, let's get this started. <laughs> 2004, pretty sweet. 
kind of like Beast Wars era. Um, <laughs> I made this in Max, and it was polygon by polygon, and it was quite an achievement back then. And then 10 years later, I was able to like, understand enough anatomy to make a piece of art that I'm fairly proud of. And you know, anyone here can do that. It's just how much you train and, and how dedicated you are to the process. Um, here's Damien's work. Yeah, I'm still proud of that. I mean, the, the, it's great. And then it's a great comparison, too. And I use, uh, for the last one, the same workflow as I show you today. It was the workflow I used for this hair. And then, it's, oh. it's a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Okay, and then Frankie's progression. This is in 2008. Pretty sweet, normal map. And 2017, badass. So you guys can, you guys can achieve, you know, anything. And, and I'm sure all, all three of us are, you know, even looking at our latest pieces, we're like, that's okay. And don't be afraid of that. Like when you go back and see like something a year old that you loved at the time and now you're like, oh, that's like, I could fix that. But don't be afraid of that and don't get discouraged because that just means your eye is even better. So I'm gonna leave you with this quote uh, from Elizabeth Gilbert. You can measure your worth by your dedication to your path and not by your successes or failures. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs>
instead oh, of the cinematics? Uh, I think you can do real-time rendering if uh, in Ornatrix, for instance, you're using this guide to make some, um, some mesh trips. So basically you're going to, instead of um, using the guide, you tr you're transforming the guide as a mesh strips in Ornatrix, and you can use that in a real-time engine. At least I think it's uh, what I will do. Nice. Way in the back, far beyond the lights. Uh, Jaime. Again. Jaime. I know that. I'm saying I know you from before. Ah, Otra vez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> sí, 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 claro. Okay, bueno. Um, so I, I really liked your, liked your presentation. I'm, I'm actually a compositor, but uh, I feel like very identified with everything you, you say. And I'm, I'm actually like, uh, like I think like a year since I last sculpted something. But thanks for uh, to your presentation, I, I like get so motivated to start that good habit of sculpting again. And he has el fuego. You have the fire yeah, now. He has the yeah. He's saying he has the passion, the fire in the belly. Yes, a, yeah, a round yeah. of applause, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Woo! Lives are being changed. Yeah, Hua. and as you say, like not always what you you get like understand the most or you are the better at is what you enjoy. Sometimes you get good at something that you don't enjoy the most. But yeah, you can say that again, pal. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Nice state. That's really good. That's very enthusiastic. I like that. Anybody else back here? Oh, oh, way in the front. I see an arm. Was there one more before I run away? No? Okay. Sounds like there's people outside trying to get in here. It's a few seats in the front. Take advantage. I saw one arm. Jutted out. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. Yeah, no sweat. Got to get one of those mobile units. I can just... Can I do it right Sorry, that's another guy. I really enjoyed how you started speaking about discipline and, and uh, being able to schedule yourself. But how do you allow yourself to have any free time? And kind of like kind of philosophy for that. You mean, how do I work it into an already busy personal or professional work schedule? How do you allow yourself right. to have free time? How do you allow yourself to have free time? Where do you have free time? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, so, I mean, here, if you think about your, your whole day, what do you need? Well, you need at least, and I mean, I probably made mistakes with this, at least six hours of sleep. I should have had eight. But from, like, you have those six hours, and then you have, let's say you have a, a 10 to 12 hour work day, you kind of work in what you, what you, you know, you prioritize that. You don't let time go. And that's kind of how I uh, was able to manage it. Be aware of your hours and you can actually fit this in because if you're a little bit out of control of your own calendar, then that's when you, you're like, oh, I don't have any free time. Well, I think you can, you can actually fit it in and I, I'm scared to show you my Google Calendar, but there's a lot of colors. <laughs> Can I add something to that? I, may, I, may I add something to that as well? Yes. Uh, I know it's not you know, uh, feasible for everybody, but uh, over the course of the last 10 years, I've only worked six miles from my office. That, that helps. That really helps my life out. Yes. I, would, I would also say, yeah. if you have a goal and you really want to go there, you will find the time. That's yeah. right. Because you will take some other stuff away, some free time, some uh, friends, like you said, mm. and you will work to go to, go to your goal. Yep. Because in the end, it's uh, hard work, but it will always pay. So. And the great thing is, it's when you are passionate about it, it comes easy, it, it, because it, you're, you enjoy the process. To wake up a little extra earlier, to get that yes. work before work, that's fun. The work after work, you look forward to because it. it's fun. It's all about love, really. You know, you use love for what you do. Um, it's as simple as that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if there's something that you love enough, like hiking, you're gonna make, you're gonna prioritize that, right? Yes. Or hanging out with your friends, or you know, like, you know, any any anything that you prioritize, you can make you can make it happen. Yes, yeah. that's a good point. You can go to bed at 10 o'clock, wake up at four in the morning, and be ahead of most people. It's true. Yeah, you will. Spend an hour doing something, you can do, yeah, you know, absolutely. 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups. Absolutely. Look pretty good in a, in a week. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.